Thanks, and I should say I'm presenting on behalf of many colleagues, and particularly um, Erica, who was the epidemiologist doing the analysis. Um, so, no conflict of interest to declare. Um, Rapidly, so MSF have been working for over 25 years in northern Mozambique, um, Mozambique, Southeast Africa, um, and point D there is Tet, which is a city that sprung up along a transport corridor where we've been working um, with HIV care for a number of years. It's where we started the community clubs, community ART groups that are well known as part of the differentiated care principles. And over the last five years, we've been uh, having a big focus on uh, sex workers and to a lesser extent, truckers along the corridor. Um, I'm going to present data collected between 2014 and 2016, a retrospective routine data, looking at the uh, outcomes of a peer-based approach to testing and particularly looking at trying to offer retesting for HIV negative sex workers. So I'll be presenting um, some of the outcomes and also we've done a qualitative study amongst of the perceptions of the peer educators in this program around attitudes to their work, which I just wanted to pick one or two things from as well. So jumping straight to the results, uh, in that period we had two and a half, over two and a half thousand sex workers enrolled. Um, of whom um, 1,781 were tested and the overall positivity was 53%. You can see a very high HIV prevalence even in the under 18s uh, at the left hand side and particularly in that group the unawareness of HIV status was very high. Overall around 50% of the sex workers reported being unaware of their HIV status. Um, when it came to retesting, the first thing to point out, you can see that 35% had no follow-up visit amongst the HIV negative. Remember, this is a highly mobile population, a large number of cross-border sex workers from Malawi uh, and Zimbabwe. About a third of the, of the uh, cohort come from Zimbabwe. Um, but amongst those who did come more than once, uh, we had a relatively good, well, you could, it depends what's good, what's bad, retesting rate. 39% of sex workers overall retested within six months, and it was around 60% amongst those who did stay within care. Um, as you can see on the bottom right there, that the overall retention uh, in care at six months was 44%. Um, we overestimate the loss to follow-up because uh, we have many, many sex workers do not give uh, the same name each time they're seen and there are different uh, sources of care. And it's also important to point out that monitoring of these cohorts for many reasons are difficult, but particularly because we're trying to provide a community-based uh, approach. We don't have clinical records to work on and we can't link most of the sex workers explicitly to clinic records. I also wanted to mention uh, an interesting finding, as I said, this testing is mostly done through the support of peer educators um, and they've been invaluable in providing access to, uh, to different sex worker groups in the community. But I'll read out a quote from one of them, talking of her peers, of, sorry, of the non-sex worker colleagues working with MSF. They don't realize, but the reason we work is for them to be able to do their work. In other words, there was a major sense that they were not recognized for what they did. They're undervalued in terms of training, in terms of salary, and in terms of respect from their colleagues. So is it good or bad? Certainly, we're getting a lot of women to retest. And the seroconversion rate, sorry, I should have said that, of 5%, when we look at a slightly longer period and a larger cohort, including Beira on the coast, we found this translates into a incidence of around 15% in this cohort. So, of course, uh, we should be offering PrEP, um, and now we are. So, I'll just jump straight to the PrEP, because one of the interesting things around PrEP is the question of, independently of its potential to prevent HIV, can it promote retesting? and through retesting, early access to treatment. And in our cohort of PrEP so far, which is around 150 women uh, enrolled to date, um, we found that over 80%, sorry, 71% have had 
two tests by six months. So it's not perfect still, but it's far, far better. And undoubtedly, PrEP has a major added value in promoting retesting. Finally, the potential for sex worker peer educators is unrealized. Far, far more needs to be done, both in terms of task shifting and offering training, support, and salaries for them to do testing, to offer self-testing. We know that many sex workers don't want to be tested by their peers, but access to self-tests through this group has major potential. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tom. We're going to hold questions to the end, um, and I just want to introduce my co-chair, um, Eric um, Flitterloo, and uh, he is the regional councillor for Global Health for the French Embassy. He's based in Thailand um, and has a huge job um, being responsible for, um, uh, for um, uh, Global Health through the French embassies in all countries in Asia. And Southeast Asia. And, sorry, Southeast. South it's already 10 countries. So. <laughs> um, now we are going to hear Mary, Mary Tumushi. Sorry, Tumushime. Uh, she's from Zimbabwe and she's uh, involved in a very interesting uh, program called STAR. It's implemented by PSI. It's a multi country program on uh, 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 self testing. Uh, of HIV, and uh, uh, Mary is the uh, Zimbabwean coordinator of this program. You have the floor. Thank you very much. It's Mary Tumushime, so you nearly said it right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> so my presentation is on views on HIV self-test kit distribution among female sex workers in Zimbabwe. The Sisters with a Voice program is run by Sesha Zimbabwe on behalf of the Ministry of Health and provides a variety of services to female sex workers, including HIV testing and HIV referral for HIV prevention and treatment. It's operational at six static sites and 30 mobile sites, 36 sites all in all. HIV self-testing may increase HIV testing uptake and frequency among female sex workers, and as part of the UNITAID PSI STAR project, has been integrated into the SISTERS program at, at the six static sites. Currently, the model of distribution of self-testing is at those sites where it's offered alongside provider-delivered testing, and among those who opt for self-testing, they can choose to do so on-site or off-site. Optimal ways of distributing self-test kits are unclear, however, so we conducted formative qualitative research to investigate views on HIV self-testing and inform community-based models for distribution to female sex workers. We conducted 15 focus group discussions among female sex workers and potential self-test kit distributors, namely sex worker peer educators who support the national program, that's the sisters program, condom promoting hairdressers, and also female condom distributors who are known as care promoters. Knowledge of HIV self-testing among female sex workers was limited. However, they did say that it, it, it was a good intervention because it provides privacy and confidentiality for people who want to test for HIV. They expressed concerns over peer educators and hairdressers being distributors. <coughs> they also did not want hairdressers to issue self-test kits um, and wondered or worried about how hairdressers would identify them as sex workers prior to engaging them on HIV self-testing. We asked female sex workers what they thought of a voucher system where they could receive vouchers for self-test kits and redeem them at various points in the community. 
and they thought that that would be an additional good strategy to distribute self-test kits to their population. Peer educators also had positive views on HIV self-testing and thought it was empowering and it could be a possible way to get their partners to test themselves for HIV. Most said they would like to distribute self-test kits if they were trained and thought they could also provide some pre-test HIV counseling alongside kit distribution. Some also said they prefer clinic-based distribution that's at the dedicated sex worker clinics and that's similar to what we found among the female sex workers. Some doubted their ability to be distributors, saying that we shouldn't trust them as they may likely misuse the self-test kits. They were also strongly against hairdressers being distributors, in part because hairdressers' partners are among their clientele. Hairdressers and care promoters, finally, were willing to distribute kits. Unlike all the other groups, hairdressers expressed the need to be paid as a means of additional income and also just to keep them motivated in their role as distributors. Care promoters, when asked about the voucher system, were also agreeable and said they could do the distribution of vouchers to sex workers for them to further collect kits at various points. All in all, most, or most potential distributors were willing to do the distribution of self-test kits, but overwhelmingly female sex workers preferred the dedicated sex worker clinics. Moving forward in the program, we'll have program staff from the sisters program distribute self-test kits at outreach to female sex workers, that's outreach in the communities, with peer educators doing mobilization, and sex workers will have the chance to collect additional self-test kits to give to partners of their choosing. I'd like to acknowledge and thank our study participants the Zimbabwe Ministry of Health and Child Care, UNITAID for funding this research, which is nested within the STAR project, my co-authors listed above, and colleagues in the STAR project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, moving on um, swiftly to um, Kelly Langhin. Um, Kelly is a physician researcher at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Massachusetts. Um, she um, assesses health needs of refugees and designs and evaluates refugee-specific interventions to improve care for this population. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. We have no conflicts of interest. Refugees in Uganda risk exposure to HIV, and many struggle to access HIV testing. Nachivali Refugee Settlement is in southwestern Uganda. It was established in 1960 and at the time of this research hosted 68,000 refugees, 52% from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 16% from Somalia, 15% from Burundi, and 15% Rwanda, 2% other. <laughs> refugees in general are housed in zones by country of origin, and there are four health clinics in Nachivali that serve refugees and Ugandan nationals and that offer free HIV testing and free antiretroviral therapy. In 2013, our routine clinic-based HIV testing study in Nache Valley increased the mean of HIV-positive clients identified per week from 0.9 to 5.6. The objective of this research was to, one, assess the feasibility and acceptability of home-based testing in Nache Valley, and two, compare home-based testing to clinic-based testing in terms of the HIV testing participants. To do this, we conducted home-based HIV testing in Nachivali, visiting homes up to three times, different days of the week, different times of day in three distinct geographic zones. To evaluate feasibility, 
we looked at the proportion of eligible and clients encountered at home. And to evaluate acceptability, we looked at the proportion of those at home willing to test for HIV. Additionally, we assessed the effect of number of individuals at home, as well as sex, on willingness to test. And we compared age, gender, refugee status, distance to clinic, and HIV testing history from home-based testers compared to clinic-based testers. Table one shows the feasibility and acceptability of home-based HIV testing. Of the 319 households visited, with 566 eligible individuals living in these households. The column titled at home shows the number of clients of eligible individuals that we encountered at home during visits one, two, three, and in total. The column titled HIV tested shows the number tested as well as the percent of those tested at home from, by visit. And the final column shows HIV positive. We found home-based HIV testing in Nacho Valley to be feasible with 90% of those um, eligible individuals encountered at home within three visits. And we found it to be acceptable with 75% of those at home willing to test. As noted in the final column, seven, were found to be, seven individuals were found to be HIV positive, and these were all found within the first two visits. Table two, titled Predictors of Willingness to Test. First, the variables, looking at one person, two people, and three to five persons, and then female and male. The next column, at home, again shows the number of individuals at home, and the final column, HIV tested, the number tested for HIV, and the percent is the proportion of those at home. For each additional person present at home, we found the odds of testing increased by 1.52. We also found no difference in willingness to test by sex. Table three looks at the characteristics of home-based testing and clinic-based HIV testing participants, comparing our cohort of home-based testers with our previous study of clinic-based testers in Nacho Valley. In row one, we see age. We see that home-based testers had a median age slightly older than clinic-based testers of 30 versus 28. In the next row, looking at the proportion that were refugee, home-based testers reached a higher proportion of refugees compared to clinic-based testers. 93% compared to 79%. Looking at distance to clinic, measured as greater than or equal to one hour from clinic, home-based testers reported that they lived farther from clinics. 74% um, reported that they lived greater than or equal to one hour, compared to 52%. And finally, the HIV prevalence among home-based testers was 1.9%, and among clinic-based testers was 3.4%. This was not a statistically significant difference. We also evaluated sex and previous HIV tests, but did not find these to be statistically significant difference. In conclusion, regarding home-based HIV testing in Nacho Valley, we found this testing strategy to be feasible, with 90% eligible encountered in three visits. We found this strategy to be acceptable, with 75% of those at home willing to test. Individuals were more willing to test with others home. And Home-based testing reached a larger proportion of refugees and those living further from clinic compared to clinic-based testing. The implications? Home-based testing visits in refugee settlements should occur during times when more people are encountered at home. And given limited resources, two home visits may be sufficient. We will need to assess linkage to care for home-based testing as distance to clinic in this setting may impact linkage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have uh, Flavia Tiokun Dronko. He's going to, uh, he's from Cameroon, sorry, and uh, he's uh, a researcher on speci and specialty in medical anthropology. He works for CARCHAMP as the HIV AIDS Senior Technical Advisor. And he's going to make a presentation, a very interesting presentation on sex test and treat, uh, implementing an incentive community-driven intervention to promote the uptake of HIV testing services among clients of sex workers. Flavien, c'est à toi. Merci, thank you. Uh, I would like to say that uh, sex work is uh, forbidden in Cameroon by law, so being involved in this activity can lead you to jail. 
but the prevalence uh, of uh, HIV among sex workers is up to 36%, and uh, female sex workers and their clients have elevated risk of acquisition and transmission of HIV and other sexually transmitted infection. Uh, so when we did this project, uh, we uh, mobilized female sex workers and gave them uh, coupons to motivate them to talk to their clients. You know, even though sex is illegal, even where it is legal, it's hard to find someone telling you, I am a client of a sex worker. So very hard. So here, uh, the project was operate with three community-based organizations in three regions. And you see that in the beginning, they tested like 400 clients of female sex workers, and which means uh, less than 100, per, uh, about 100 per CBO per quarter, which means less than 30 per month. But gradually, when we moved to this area, we noticed that they were even testing less than 25 clients per month, which is really bad. And then we were just wondering how to do this. And this is how we initiated this approach of uh, no longer moving in the street to, add, to, to ask people whether they ever visited sex workers so that they can be referred for active testing, but to go directly where sex takes place. We went to the hotspot and we rented rooms next to the rooms where sex workers operate and set lab in there. And when you give coupon to the sex worker and train them how to manage this coupon and how to motivate the clients to, to get tested. So when they get their clients after sex, when the client is still hot, they will give him a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> and just take him to the next door and where he can be tested. And so this has been proven so effective because now per night, we can test up to a hundred clients per, per site. Uh, and that's what explained that you had this number of more than 1,000 yeah, uh, client tested. And this was not in the quarter. It, it seems like it's in the quarter. This was just a month following this quarter. We tested that. <laughs> because the capacity of the project now is even to test more than 3,500 clients per quarter using this approach. Because you really identify the real clients not someone who might be motivated in the street if you said you, I can refer you to the drop-in center for testing, then you can be interested in the $2 taxi. But in this place, you don't give any phoenix to the clients, but you only give the $1 for the sex workers who successfully refer a client to be tested with this coupon. So at the end of the evening, in the night, actually, because the project start, I mean, the activity will start around 7 p.m. and end around 2, 2 a.m. in the night. So at the, in the end, at the, uh, uh, at the end of the activity in the night, coupons are uh, uh, put together and each sex worker will just pass by and collect her money according to the number of coupons distributed. So this has been proven very effective because the, the sex workers feel so proud because since they are considered as people who practice illegal activities, this time, there was even a newspaper article saying that sex workers are motivating clients to test, which is for advocacy a wonderful thing because people view them differently now as uh, health educator, animators, people can do some help, useful work in the community. <laughs> and for the clients, they were very satisfied because most of them have never tested before and they found that being tested directly where they went for business was effective because they avoid waiting for a long run in the hospital they avoid being seen by people in the hospital because this happened in the night, in the hidden place. And so for clients, they found it so sexy to be tested in this area. <laughs> so the lesson we learned from this was that more clients are satisfied to have these services available in a discreet <coughs> place and no crowd at the case, uh, at the, as the case with mass screening. And some clients have never been tested before and are happy to do so because they were convinced by the female sex workers. And female sex workers will be useful to the community with this new role as they mobilize clients to know their status. Some even feel that they will be less stigmatized in the future because they are often considered as those spreading disease around. They can gain some extra money from this job 
which, which is very motivating from them. Thank you. Merci Flavien. Uh, and now we're going to hear Maria Cecilia Ferreira Arellano. Uh, she, no, but it was not. It ah, is, it is so long. Oh, okay. Cecilia I'm, I'm, is I'm enough. Sorry, let me think. <laughs> Cecilia, uh, Cecilia, what are you going to do? So you are from Spain. I'm from you Argentina. From, but it said from Spain on your biography. We catch up later. Okay, so I'm from, from Argentina. <laughs> I'm not amused. It says that I'm coming from MSF, I'm Spain. Not, so you are from MSF, so Médecins Sans Frontières, so you are a little bit forgiven, but just a little bit. <laughs> and uh, uh, my God, you have, work, you, you have worked in so many countries, from Kenya to China, DRC, Somalia, Uganda, and now Sudan. And is that correct? Yeah. And uh, you have been involved mainly in uh, uh, implementation of HIV and TB activities. And now you are going to do a presentation on a test and start program in Sudan, and then in South Sudan. And it's uh, a very interesting program because it's uh, focusing in rural areas. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll Sorry, catch up later. Um, <laughs> so okay, just try to pronounce my family name and you'll see <laughs> how difficult this <laughs> is. Okay, so um, I declare that I don't have any conflict of interest and I feel very proud of it. Um, <laughs> so I'm here to present um, our experience implementing a test and start program in a rural conflict affected area of South Sudan. So a um, uh, just small thing is that we, with this program we are trying to target not only the first 90 but also the second 90. Uh, so for the ones who don't know where South Sudan is, it's in really in the middle, in the middle of Africa and it's, uh, the area where we work is called Yambio. And as you can see, it's very close to the borders with Central African Republic, Congo and Uganda. So the adult HIV prevalence in country is around 3%. However, in Western Equatoria area where Yambio is, uh, it is as high as 7%. Um, there are HIV services available, but they are really centralized at the hospital level, so there is nothing outside. I don't know what is going on with the... Okay, it's okay. Um, there is not access in the rural areas, uh, so people need to come to the hospital to get access to HIV <coughs> testing and treatment. And as you can see, it's a very low ART coverage, below 20%. And on top of that, it's a, a conflict-affected area since 2015. Um, and in, fo in fact, this conflict has been going on and on for ages, and it has been a peaceful place until we start this project and six months later become an unstable setting. Uh, so the objective of this, of this pilot project was to bring HIV closer and ART initiation closer to the community uh, and hence to increase ART coverage and reduce the rates of loss of follow-up in the area, implementing early ART initiations and we wanted to assess the feasibility and acceptability of, of this program. So um, I, I try to simplify the methods. So basically what we've done is a strong component on community health workers and health promotion for the first two weeks of the project. So we have this bunch of community health workers going to this area and explaining what MSF is doing there and explaining uh, that we were coming with clinics and to, that to, te to offer HIV testing. So we need the leaders agreement as well to perform this activity. So when we felt that we were ready, we start launching these decentralized mobile teams uh, performing HIV testing, ART initiations, follow-up of patients, drug refilling. And what you see in green is the contingency plan package that happens to happen after the six months of initiation of this project to ensure continuation of treatment. Um, so as you can see, um, the health education and mobilization has been the key part of the project to start. And when the community health workers felt that the community was ready, we launched our mobile clinics. So we were working with five mobile clinics in the beautiful MSF Land Cruisers. So each of these five clinics will have one clinical officer, one counselor, one lab tech, and uh, one community health worker. So they will arrive to one place, they will set up this 
clinic, this tent. Um, previously, the community health workers have been passing the message around the community, which days are we coming? And then people will come, they will get a pre group of pretest counseling, then individual counseling. And then they are the ones who were positive, they were offered to start same day ART initiation. And if they didn't feel okay with the same day, we would offer to get back for further counseling and ART initiation. And then um, these places that we call drop-in centers uh, remain like um, mobile clinics, but this is the place where the patients were still coming for follow-up and refilling of drugs. And the beautiful contingency plans that we have to create after six months, because we were not allowed to go to the places where the patients were, and patients couldn't move because of the conflict. So through the community health workers and some associations of people living with HIV, we de developed this, what we call runaway bags, and we are already using it in other conflict-affected settings, including three months of treatment to ensure continuation of, of, of treatment. Um, so these are early results because this uh, project started mid-2015. Um, so around more than 13,800 people have been tested at community level by community health workers. And 442 of them have been found out to be positive. And 77% have accepted same-day ART initiation. Um, and one thing to highlight here is that 60% of these people had CD4 below 500. Um, so when we go through the cascade, you can see um, that ART initiation, uh, may, some people might be happy by having 100%. I feel more comfortable having this close to 80% because it means that people doesn't feel forced to start ART, because this is one of the fears with test and start at the same day. Uh, so retention in care is around 80% for the overall cohort. However, at six months, 80, 84%, and at 12 months, we have a retention in care of 81%. Um, and among patients with available viral load, which is around 40% of the cohort, 86% of them are virologically suppressed. So as conclusion, we can say that this pilot project and testing and starting ARTs in the community is feasible and it was highly accepted in this setting. Uh, we are happy to see that retention in care and biological suppression are comparable to programs at primary healthcare uh, level in non-conflict affected settings. Uh, essentials, contingency plans, this has been a lesson learned for us, should include these runaway bugs. And uh, from MSF point of view, um, we would like this strategy should we, to be replicated in other contexts with no access to ART and instability. Thank you very much. Thanks to the field team. Thank you very, very much, uh, Maria. Um, wow, what a challenge and uh, what a fantastic result. Cecilia. I'm, I'm going to be, people are going to be telling me off as well after, yeah. Um, our final um, presenter in this, uh, in this panel, and I'll probably pronounce this incorrectly as well, is uh, Mastula uh, Nanfuka. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> so Mastula is um, a young presenter. Uh, she's under 30. Um, with a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery from Macquarie University, a postgraduate diploma in monitoring evaluation, and she works as a study coordinator for the long-term outcomes of ART in a Uganda study that was hosted um, uh, by um, the AIDS Support Organization. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm presenting work from... Oh, sorry. Escape. Escape. Okay, yes, I'm presenting on behalf of um, my team from the Aid Support Organization, John Hopkins University, um, the Wellcome Trust in Malawi, and Ministry of Health Uganda, and that is the team I worked with. Um, so the background to our study is that uh, for most of the presentations that we've seen, 
uh, we have very few men who are actually testing. And in my country, the last AIDS indicator survey we did, we actually had less than 45% of men testing. And uh, this is very, uh, this challenge is uh, big among fishing communities because of the nature of their work. We know that during the day they are actually fishing and uh, that is when we have most of these services happening. And then, um, so, so, so there is really rem limited access. And then we have also noted that uh, w um, a number of uh, self-testing studies have been done and uh, we are actually using men to women models. However, we know that in resource limited settings, uh, especially the developing countries, we still have the issue of power dynamics. So we, we felt that uh, in our study, we probably need to use a peer-to-peer -peer model where a man goes out to look for a fellow man and see whether it actually works. And the main objective of this study was to assess the feasibility and acceptability of this model. So how did we go about this? Um, our original plan was to have 20 index uh, participants who are known as the SEEDs, and uh, these people were, were introduced to the HIV self-testing, and then we also trained them in pre, basic pre-HIV counseling, and they received a pack which had five kits, um, a coupon that uh, indicated um, a referral to the public health facility where our research assistants were stationed, and then we also gave them five kits and instructions that, want, that were translated in the local language. And uh, after one month, they, the, the people they distributed the kits to had to return them to the health facility. And we conducted self-interviews using the um, audio computer assisted self-interview method. And then a confirmatory test was run for them. Uh, so in the results, we, we managed to have 19 seeds Ten of them were HIV positive and in care with us in Tasso, and then nine of them were uh, actually unknown status. Not um, sorry for that. And these 19 people, remember that all of them were given five kits to go out and distribute. So they managed to approach 115 men within the landing sites that we're working with. And out of those ones, we had 95% accept the kits. And we also noted that uh, the range of refusal ranged from one to eight uh, people that they were contacting. And uh, it was uh, refusal was higher among people with unknown status. And then out of those, 29 were first time testers, they had never tested before. And then 42, which is 44.2%, had tested more than a year ago. And I think that is uh, quite uh, good because it, 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 it shows that they actually targeted the right people that we, we are looking for. Um, then we assessed, because the primary objective for this study was looking at safety um, and, uh, and, and adverse events. So. We, we didn't report, uh, we, there was no coercion from the seeds, coercing the recruits to take on the, coup, the, the, the kids. And uh, there was only one case of hostility for, uh, from the family members of the recruit that was being given a kid. Um, then our yield was uh, 4%. And the accuracy, sensitivity was 100%, and then uh, specificity was 93%. So we, for the false positives that we got, we actually had a, a gray line in the, test, in the test location area. But uh, also we had uh, two people reported um, having used the kits uh, wrongly. They didn't follow the instructions very well. And from the results here, as much as the yield seemed um, a little low, we, we, we actually note that uh, these people can actually identify the, the right people to, to test. And, and we know that for, for the general testing, we normally have uh, so many repeat testers actually coming back to test, but here we can see that we have the right people. So we recommend, uh, in conclusion, we think uh, the network-based distribution model for HIV self-testing is actually very feasible, and it will contribute to, to reaching the first 90, especially um, among men, and therefore we recommend that it's taken up in other in other, in other groups. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our fabulous panel who've been kept brilliantly to time, which means we've got, um, we've got 20 minutes for, for questions. So please get to your microphones and uh, um, we can take, take questions.
You have mics on the on both sides of the of the yeah. Please state your name and where you come from. Hi, you. I'm. Uh, your is this on? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Bill Reedy from ICAP. I have a question for the last presenter from Uganda. There were tests um, that were distributed to positive and negative individuals. Do you have any thoughts coming out of this about the uh, strategy going forward? Should uh, the kits be provided mainly to positive people or also to negative people? Uh, do you have any evidence coming out of that that would sort of inform us going forward? Do we take some other questions? Yeah, let's take, let's take, let's yeah. take three questions and then, um, yeah. yeah. Ma'am? Yeah. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Mutinta Nalubamba from Society for Family Health in Zambia. My question is for the speaker from Cameroon. Um, I just wanted to find out what you put in place for linkage to care for those men that tested uh, positive mm. from the, while they were still very hot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Russell Dakin, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, my question is, is for the Uganda presenter and uh, around the uh, reduced specificity. I'd just like to know a little bit more about at what time frame you you read the kits to get those uh, those figures. Okay. Shall we have um, uh, the last presenter on those two questions? Um. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, the first question: um, Should we provide the kits to HIV positive or negative people? Um, I would like to say that from, from this study, we actually noted the people who are in care and were, um, were okay, people who are in care, those are the HIV positive people. We, we've actually taken them uh, through a number of trainings and uh, they are able to, to, to actually explain to, to their peers what it means to, to test and what it means to be positive. And therefore, they, they kind of have um, a higher bargaining power and uh, confidence to approach um, their peers to, to take up the, the, the testing because they, they're actually working through, they're talking from an experience point of view. And that is why we actually saw uh, limited refusals from, from that, particular, that particular group. But um, we, we are planning to scale up this and, and, and study that, 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 that factor more. Then the second one is the time frame. Um, I would like to say that uh, when we gave out these kits, we, we had 82% uh, of the people use the kits immediately and bringing them back to, to the public health facility. So this was, uh, the reading was uh, within, uh, because these, these learning sites are actually, it's, uh, it's a small area, so they returned the kids almost immediately after using them. So it was uh, within a maximum an hour. And uh, Dr. Flavin, on the um, linkage of the, yeah. the hot men. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So for these hot clients, so we have some cool psychosocial counselors and peer navigators who are also in the spot. So as soon as one is positive, he's referred to these people and then they counsel him and refer him to the hospital. So we have good retention rate with this client, only maybe more than 80%. So some few are just those clients who come from different cities and just want to enjoy the evening at the hotspot. At times you have difficulties to trace them, but the retention, the in initiation and retention rate with this client is really high. But uh, one other thing I would say with this client is that the, uh, doing this mass testing of client or for client help us to understand that the, the yield for uh, clients is really low com as compared to what we find with commercial sex workers. So HIV with commercial sex worker doesn't come from clients. It just comes from the non-paid client, <coughs> what the, uh, people that sex workers themselves consider as their husbands, only that you have a husband for Monday, another one for Tuesday, another one for Wednesday, and so on. The question. question. Yeah, another round of question, uh, Dr. Sian. Yes, um, I'm Sian. I'm the director of Kanda Center for Population Health Research in Cambodia, and um, we also conducted a study on the feasibility 
and acceptabilities of um, HIV cell tests among different key populations in the countries. And we found that it was um, it, it deemed um, feasible and it was well accepted by those key population. And um, once we had, um, you know, the a kind of uh, dissemination meeting with uh, the program's people, we got um, a lot of questions around, um, you know, this the way that we should uh, that the uh, HIV cell test should be should be distribu distributed and also um, the cost. But I'm I'm more interested um, in hearing um, your experience. I mean, my question is a bit um, general, so it could be directed to to um, the speakers or uh, even chairs or anyone in the room who could share the experience or ideas concerning the um, kind of feasible mechanism that could be used to um, reach um, the target population with um, pre and post test counseling before getting the, I mean, for the HIV self test. How people, how those people could, could get pre test counseling before they do the self testing. And then um, how they get there, how they can reach to um, post test counseling, that one thing. And another thing around after getting tested positive, how those people could be linked to care treatment. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. My, I'm called uh, Dr. Kajim David uh, from Tasso, Uganda. Um, my question goes to the presenter from Cameroon about that novel practice. One of the biggest challenges we are facing is ident uh, trying to access and test and offer services to the partners of sex workers. Uh, what what you presented, I, I, I saw some ray of hope that, you know, there are those types of the steady partners to the sex workers and then the, the casual. Uh, but for, for either of them, we we'll want to design programs to really get to them. So I thought that this kind of coupon system is good, but what I want to know, to kind of get a better understanding of it, is it some kind of incentivized out, output-based approach whereby you, as, as you give these coupons to the sex workers, at two, uh, after the work is done, um, each person, sh uh, uh, like accounts for how many coupons they have distributed, then you give them money, and if so, would you give the test kits to these sex workers to test their clients uh, uh, as a way of motivating them? Uh, so I want to know, and we, uh, if for both the, the casual and the steady, to which category would that work best for, so that uh, it can help us to also improve our programming? Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Victoria Watson from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and I work on the STAR project. And my question is for the Ugandan um, study. Um, part of the work that we've been completing at Liverpool is um, looking at late reading of the Orishaw test kits. And the 6% that you say that you've seen the grey lines in is relatively small as we've seen in 444 tests, we've seen a 29% um, incidence of the grey lines appearing after. Um, three days. Um, my colleague asked you a question about at which point did you reread these tests and how quickly after the test being performed, um, whether it was on label or off label from the manufacturer's instructions, and you've indicated that you read these ones within an hour. So is that correct in saying that you could see these grey lines within an hour of the self-tester using them? Right, let's take, take those questions. Shall we start with the general question? Um, I think anybody can answer this. Um, uh, um, ideas for how we can best um, uh, provide some pre-test counselling, post-test counselling and linkage um, for self-testing. Who would like to answer that? Okay, let me, uh, let me do that. Uh, from our experience from our study, what, what we did for the uh, pre-test uh, pre -test counseling is uh, we, we, we had these people taken through a session and of uh, how they can approach their recruits and uh, train them. We did role plays with them of how they are supposed to, to deliver this information to these people. And then we went ahead and um, had uh, an information guide that was translated into the local language who were giving basic information on HIV, what, what does it mean to be HIV positive, what can you do if you're HIV positive, and what can you do if you're HIV negative. And then um, the other issue is uh, we, we, we offered hotlines 
on, 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 on our coupons. So which means that uh, at any one point, these people would call the, the, our research assistants who are trained counselors um, so to, to help out our, the recruits. And uh, still, the phone, the phone worked for post-test counseling. The people who tested positive in our study, definitely the moment uh, they tested, they were very distressed, but they called the research assistants and they talked to them. They offered online counseling and then encouraged them to come to the health facility and they actually came to the health facility, further counseled them and then uh, linked them into care. So all of them were actually linked into care because these people were stationed within the public health facility that offers ART services. So that is how we, we actually managed to, to, to even have the linkage bit for, for our participants. And uh, also the other thing about the linkage is that uh, we said our coupons were, had serial numbers and they were linked to the people who are distributing them. So at a particular point in time, we, we kept following up with them to, to actually find out the location of these people. In case someone did not turn up, we could even do a home visit to go and look for them where they are. So that is kind of the beauty of the peer-to-peer -peer if you're in touch with the person recruiting this person. It means you can gain access to, 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 the, to, to these people. Then about the, the reading, um, the instructions say we have to read it within 20 minutes and we clearly stress this as we're giving out these kids. And uh, I, would, I, would, I would want to say that the, these results were read within, for the recruits, the ones who tested, they, 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 they read them within 20 minutes. But of course, like, um, there's a, there was a, a time of testing and returning the kids to the, to the health facility. And like I said, majority of them returned the kids almost immediately on the same day after after testing, but then some of them, it took them almost up to one hour to return the used kit to the health facility. And the false positives, what we did is that we repeated a self-test uh, with them because uh, uh, some of them uh, didn't read the instructions very well, and that is why we are seeing this. And the self-test was actually negative, and we also repeated the confirmatory, which was negative. Yeah, I just wanted to add something on that. I mean, I think the, the issue of counselling and, and uh, linkage to care are very context-specific. Um, we have in a number of our MSF offices now self-tests available like condoms. And if people are fully aware, if you have mass media, if you have alternatives to face-to-face, uh, -face, which is the reason why a number of people don't test in the first place, if you insist on a face-to-face -face pre- and post-test counselling, then you will not leverage the added value of the tests. For other people who regularly test, it's a completely different issue. So we need to be very clear on that, but certainly I see no reason why with a good health promotion media, mass media around self-tests, there is any need for pre- or post-test counselling as an essential. It should always be available, but it should not be mandated. Dr. Flavian, um, how are we going to reach these, these regular partners, husbands, spouses? Yeah, thank you for the questions. I would like to say that uh, normally if you, we go in a hot spot uh, during hot period from yeah. Thursday to Saturday evening, we give coupon on Thursday. At the end of the day, we collect the rest of the coupon, all of them. We don't leave the sex workers with the coupon so that they might just give it to any person there. So. This is for, but this system operates well for the casual partners, so don't use it for steady partners. People that sex workers might be calling their husband or non-pay partners, so don't use it for them. For this category of partners, we operate with contact tracing. I tell you, 36% uh, of them are positive, so which means 64% are negative. But if you are trying to do contact tracing for all the sex workers, you might be wasting a lot of resources. So we focus mostly on those who are positive and trace their partner now, invite them actively now for testing. And so this is how we do it. Self-testing is not yet authorized in the country, so we cannot use this approach, uh, given the issues that uh, people might uh, mention, like what do you do with pre-test counseling, what do you do with post-test counseling, or linkages, linkage to, to care. So we, we don't use this approach yet because it's not yet uh, uh, formalized in the country. So we mostly do contact tracing for the steady partners. 
but we have some SOP. My poster is just at the end of the, in this floor, so the some SOP are on the poster, but we can also discuss so that I give you my contact and we can exchange more. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. We can take two more questions, these two gentlemen. Thank you. David oh, Paltiel from uh, the United States. Oh, okay. Sorry. Do it fast. David Paltiel from the United States. Question for Kelly. Uh, what do you make of your finding that you get better yield when there's lots of people at home? I would have thought that privacy considerations would militate in favor of people wanting to test when they're alone. Okay. Th thank you. Uh, Malani from Botswana Harvard Partnership, Botswana. My question goes to Dr. Ochlachlin. Um, would you please help me understand the column two and column three? There is decreasing percentage of people who tested HIV per visit, as well as the decreasing positivity rate. How do you get, were you visiting the same households and finding the same people and treating uh, and testing after how long? or with these new people? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Abu Hakim, PDC. Uh, you use the microphone because we are quite Thank old you. here. Thank uh, you. Abu Hakim, CDC. Kelly of um, building on this other question, did you find any differences in acceptability based on whether or not the household or the person you first encountered um, already was aware that they had HIV? Thank you for these good questions. Are we OK? It's OK. So first, um, Dr. Paltiel, uh, regarding um, the finding that more people were willing to test when more people were home, we were somewhat surprised by that numbers-wise and just from previous reviews of the literature. However, being present at the study site, I wasn't surprised. Um, culturally, when partners were together, it seemed that more, more were willing to test, particularly women, when their male partner was home, um, it seemed okay and they wanted to get the results together more frequently which was somewhat surprising, but um, regarding the question that when you looked down the columns, we found decrease, less people were t testing HIV positive. Um, we did do repeat visits to houses, um, consecutive days, three days in a row at different times of day. Um, I'm not exactly sure why we seem to find more people positive early on, except for that maybe if they were more likely to be positive, they were more interested in what their results were, what their status was, and maybe they were more, maybe they were more willing to test. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, exa although that's my hypothesis. Um, and regarding the question from the CDC, which was looking at, I'm sorry, the additional people. <laughs> Who tested? I love that question, and we didn't look at that, but maybe we will go back and do so before we publish. Thank you. Uh, John, do you want to, to say something? Yeah, it's a little apropos of none of the questions, but since we have three of the presentations here on sex work, I wanted to uh, put out a call for decriminalization of sex work. And since one of the presenters, I think from Cameroon, mentioned specifically the difficulty of getting men to test, uh, who, and of course, if you ask a man whether he's seen a sex worker and it's illegal, he's not going to tell you. So it is decriminalization of sex work as opposed to decriminalization of sex workers. And I think it behoves all of us who are involved in research with sex worker communities to respect the call for that. So I hope that any of you who are in NGOs or research bodies would ask your donors, your communities, and the governments of countries where you work to support decriminalization of sex work. Um, and on that note, I would, I would like to add that, um, that WHO um, certainly um, in our guidelines on key populations calls for exactly the same thing. So um, wholeheartedly support you on that. What a fantastic panel. I have learned so much. I am, I am really in awe of the work that you're doing. Um, it's great to have a session on, on testing, and I was um, complaining a little bit before that um, there wasn't enough on testing, a lot on self-testing, but, but um, great to have other testing also highlighted in the conference. Thank you for being a great audience. Thank you for your great questions, and a final round of applause for our fabulous presenters. <laughs> <laughs>